Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lisa Bush, and this week I'm the Acting Chief of Division for the Place and Communities uh, Division here at Geoscience Australia. I am also the branch head of the National Location Information uh, Branch, and it is from this branch that we have three exceptional staff members along today to uh, give a presentation today at our uh, Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar series. Um, before I give an introduction uh, to uh, our presenters, uh, I firstly wanted to uh, uh, provide an acknowledgement of country and then also give you guys a thank you for your time uh, here this morning. Uh, so in terms of acknowledgement of country, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, water and community. We pay our respect to the people, the cultures and the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, for many of you today, that will be on Ngunnawal and Nambri country here in uh, Canberra, but I do note that we've got a number of people dialed in from across uh, the country, so I extend that to the countries from which you are dialing into uh, today. I would also like to thank you uh, personally for taking some time to be able to dial into today's Wednesday seminar. Uh, I know that many of you have been uh, um, had a bit of time off for the October long weekend, and hopefully you were able to um, uh, have a really good time in some incredible weather. And I also know that many of you um, have had some time with school holidays, and for some of you, it's been both. So thank you for taking the time today to dial in. I can see that we have quite a few people dialed in today, which is uh, excellent. Uh, the presentation today is uh, titled, uh, it's, it's a pretty cool title actually, <laughs> um, Cloudy with a Chance of Innovation, and it's really about remote data, power and map mastery, and presented by Daniel McIlroy, Catherine Owen and Lauren Carter. And I think that you'll get a bit out of today. It's been really born out of a couple of uh, this body of work has been brought out of necessity, really. Um, part of it has been the experience through COVID and having to work re remotely and in different ways. And part of it is that we have to be more efficient and effective at our core business. So how can we capitalise on um, capabilities and technology that's sitting there right now to enable us to do what we do better? And, and so um, we'll take you on a bit of a journey today. At the end, I'll um, curate some questions. So feel free to drop questions along uh, along the way into the chat and I'll um, uh, present some of those to our, um, our uh, presenters at the end of this presentation. But before I begin, let's just do a quick introduction of our three speakers today. Uh, so the first I'd like to talk to you about um, is Daniel McIlroy. With over 15 years of experience in the spatial industry, uh, Daniel's journey began as a cartoon cartographer before transitioning into GIS Enterprise Platform Administration. His experience bridges technical and user needs, underscoring the importance of stakeholder engagement. As a data lead integration at Geoscience Australia's National Location Information Branch, uh, Daniel oversees a virtual environment for data translation from civilian to military specification and serves as the defence liaison for Geoscience Australia. Our second presenter is Lauren Carter, who has over 20 years experience in the spatial industry and currently leads the cart cartography, my apologies, the cartography team within Geoscience Australia's National Location Information Branch. Her expertise lies primarily in topographic mapping, where she plays a vital and pivotal role in managing Geosciences Australia topographic mapping products, including national base maps, web services and online services. And our third presenter today is Catherine Owen, who has over 15 years of geoscience experience and who began her journey as a student of geology in Western Australia's gold fields before specialised in volcanology and hazards. She joined Geoscience Australia in 2013 as, and has enjoyed many opportunities, including working as emergency response coordinator before focusing more intently on geospatial analysis as part of our branch here. Now, as a senior geospatial analyst, Catherine uses advanced technology to translate location data into tailored specifications and closely monitoring monitors emerging trends and technologies to ensure the branch's continuous evolution. And so I'll hand over now to these uh, three presenters and look forward to um, having a bit of a chat at the end of this presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. Hi everyone, so as Lisa said, um, I'm Catherine Owen and I'm a member of the National Location Information Branch at Geoscience Australia. Our branch is dedicated to curating and providing high value, top quality national spatial data. In essence, our primary objective is to continuously enhance the entire data to product pipeline. This pipeline serves, serves as the conduit where data, or better yet information, is ingested, processed and transformed into valuable products or knowledge. 
These products can then ultimately empower better decision making, leading to increasing Australia's economic, environmental and social prosperity. This is our branch's um, aim under Geoscience Australia's Strategy 2028. In our pursuit of this mission, we are always on the lookout for innovative ways to improve, to streamline our processes and to adapt to the challenges that we encounter. This seminar will showcase two recent examples of how we've accomplished this, as well as what's on the horizon for our team. As Lisa mentioned, to kick us off, my colleague Daniel will share with you how we've adapted during the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, leveraging the power of cloud technology. And following Daniel, Lauren will delve into how we've modernised our topographic map production, embracing advancements to enhance our workflows. Then to wrap up, I will briefly speak about the next steps in our journey of innovation. Finally, as Lisa mentioned, we'll have a Q&A session, so please keep your questions in mind as we move through the seminar or place them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Daniel, over to you. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, I'll get straight into it. In Towards the end of 2019, uh, Geoscience Australia and the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation, who are responsible for the topographic mapping in both the civilian and military sectors for Australia, uh, started a collaboration to update the foundation data that underpins those maps. Um, Lauren will talk about it in more detail later, but traditionally the maps, the way the maps are produced uh, is very time intensive and there's a lot of work that goes behind it. Um, so we were looking at a way that we can ensure that both the civilian and military space are using the same foundation data for the decision making, particularly in light of the 2019-2020 bushfire season. Um, as we investigated the needs of that project, uh, we realised that the local network storage on our uh, infrastructure here at Geoscience Australia wasn't going to be able to handle the growth in data that we were looking at. Uh, we were expecting the project to grow by about 500 gigabytes of data a quarter. Um, so we were starting to look at alternatives in early 2020 um, and really all of that uh, was pointing towards cloud as the solution. Of course, we all know what happened later in early 2020. Uh, the COVID pandemic meant that we all ended up working from home. Um, and so it created some unique uh, situation. It created a unique environment for us to start looking at some other ways that we can innovate the way we work um, with that data, not just around storage. Um, so with the pandemic, we realised that we had all the staff working from home, but where those homes were was not all tied to Canberra. Uh, at the time, we had a staff member in Brisbane, Sydney, um, two people in Canberra and somebody in Melbourne as well. Um, that was a mixture of contractors and uh, public service staff. Um, and so we ended up with a situation where we had inconsistent versions of software because of people being able to use whatever they had available to them at the time. The ability to freight computers around Australia was very difficult at that time. Um, so we were starting to have some issues with that as well. And all of this pointed to uh, the idea of potentially building a virtual environment in the cloud for us to use. And so that's what we did. We uh, use AWS or the Amazon Web Services um, to build virtual machines, which is um, a computer that exists in no physical state. Um, it's something that you connect to. Um, and on those machines, we were able to install the software that we uh, that we use, which is FME, um, which stands for Feature Manipulation Engine that's created by a company called Safe Software. Um, we also use ArcGIS Desktop, ArcGIS Pro and QGIS, which is an open source GIS package. Um, and these are the key tools that we use um, for uh, manipulating the data that we're using from one uh, format into another, um, doing some generalization on that data and exporting it out in the format that we need. Um, we also uh, needed to li license those uh, applications and that's a complicated process. We use proprietary software for a lot of these things and we uh, looking at an environment that doesn't use a traditional licensing model. Um, so we worked very closely with our in-house enterprise GIS team who are responsible for managing those licenses at Geoscience Australia. Um, and they were able to provide us with five of each type of license for the initial prototyping work. Um, we uh, were able to set up a little license server in the cloud, which meant that we didn't have to authorize and deauthorize standalone licenses, which is how uh, offline computing had been done in the past. Um, this gave us a lot more flexibility in terms of uh, being able to add or remove machines. Um, we 
looked at the different types of storage, but because of the software that we were using, we needed storage that we could connect to through a letter drive in Windows, um, which meant that the uh, the cheapest chip storage that Amazon provides, which is called S3, um, just wasn't applicable for what we were needing, and we needed to investigate some other options. Um, we stumbled across something called Windows File Server or FSX, which is an AWS product um, that we were able to use for our project work, and we were able to utilize the cheapest storage, the S3, uh, for our archiving purposes, something things that we didn't need to work on regularly. Um, and then finally, um, as part of the need to use that Windows file server, we also had to set up a simple directory service. Um, that's um, something that controls usernames and passwords, the way that you log into your work networks. We had to set up a very simple one of those uh, in the cloud to control access to that file server. Um, it's the old line about you never pull up the carpet in your house because before you know it, you're tearing down walls. Um, we thought it would be a simple process to just add that type of storage. And before we knew it, we were having to upskill in a whole bunch of different areas in cloud technology. So the virtualized desktop environment, it enabled us to shift from physical hardware um, to virtual machines. Um, and traditionally, the drawback with that is that um, all of your storage exists on servers in the build, in a building somewhere, usually the basement of your office. Um, and so to have a virtualized desktop, you would have to still connect back into the building um, to access that data. And that latency would cause issues compared to having a machine plugged into your network. But as soon as we moved our data into the cloud as the primary driver, it started to make sense then in the other direction to move the compute or the, the virtual processing up next to that. Um, cloud to cloud is much faster than cloud to building, whichever way you use it. Um, and so that was our primary driver for moving it. Um, it. Obviously, we were able to create that consistency around software versioning, um, and it meant that we were able to expand our recruitment outside of the ACT. The other thing that it allowed for us that uh, was an unexpected benefit at the time was that um, we had colleagues who had very strict social distancing rules in their buildings, uh, and those buildings worked in uh, environments that meant that they weren't able to work from home. Um, so we had excess capacity in other parts of the project that meant that we could bring them online using their own personal devices to connect to this environment. Uh, and the final thing that's been the longest uh, standing upside of the project uh, has been the ability to increase the size of the machines as we need them. So by that, I mean, uh, in the past, even a physical machine that might have cost 10 or more thousand dollars um, for high performance computing could sit and run over a weekend to process something. Uh, we're able to spin up a machine that can be many times the size of that and very, very expensive per hour. But instead of running for four days, it might run for four hours. And when it's finished, we turn it off and we no longer pay for it. Um, and that's been a real benefit that we're uh, able to respond rapidly to high demand processing without having to incur big upfront costs of physical hardware. But it hasn't all been smooth sailing. As I alluded to before, we've had some issues and some very steep learning curves. Um, the software licensing was a really big one. When we first started that process of building licensed servers, um, we did not know if that was going to work. Uh, nobody in the house, in the building had ever tried that before. Um, to set up a small licensed server in the cloud and authorize and deauthorize your software uh, as you need it from those virtual machines, which is the way that a traditional network would license software. Um, we'd always use the standalone licensing, which you had to authorize and deauthorize. And if you ever accidentally shut down the, or terminated the machine without returning the license, you lose the license. Um, and one of the, the things with this is that it works fantastically. Uh, we've got these machines walled off from everything except the machines that are using the software. Um, and they just sit there, they do their job, and it's been a tremendous success. Um, we've needed a blend of licenses. Uh, FME uh, has its own license, but because we're writing out in proprietary ESRI formats, we've also needed ESRI licenses to get access to uh, writing out in that format, which is file geodatabase. Um, and we've also needed to use ArcGIS Pro for some generalization work as well. Um, 
The cloud engineering component of it has been, particularly as I mentioned about the directory service is the biggest one, um, but learning how to develop those technologies, uh, understand how those systems work. It's not something that we're traditionally trained in as spatial professionals. Um, so we leveraged a lot of help from our um, cloud enablement team um, and from uh, AWS help forums and help documentation uh, to try and get that up and running. And it took us a little while, but we got there. And again, it, it works reasonably well. And one of the big upsides to that is, um, and it kind of transitions into the security requirement. Uh, when we bring new users onto the project, um, we give them a username and password. Uh, they don't have to access the AWS console. They don't have to understand anything that's going on under the hood. They get an address. Uh, we whitelist their IP address so that they have access uh, and they use their username and password to connect. Um, and so we've had some really good positive upsides to having that directory service in place um, around bringing on new users. Um, and again, that so that leads me into security. And we've worked really hard to make sure that we work really closely with our cybersecurity team, that they are aware of what we're doing, um, that we uh, are compliant with their reporting requirements um, so that they know that our machines are patched and up to date and they're able to uh, reach out to us when they're notified of any security vulnerabilities that they become aware of. Uh, and with the the project, we've had some what's called unstable staffing. People have come and gone from the project over the now three and a half years. Um, but the virtual environment means that we are confident that um, we're able to provide the right machinery, the right software, the right licensing, and that all of the data is in the place that people are able to work with it. So. Uh, this kind of touches on some of the stuff I've just spoken about, but the the license server just works. Um, that's been something that has been a huge benefit. Um, it went from prototype to production very, very quickly on that one. Um, it means that we're able to scale all other components of what we do, um, the size of the machines, the size of the storage. Um, FSX or the Windows File Server, um, that has been a really great um, use of technology for us. Uh, we can mount it like a Windows Direct. Like it's, we add it like you would add a, a network drive or um, a USB drive. It just appears as a drive letter um, in, win in the Windows machines. Um, but it works differently um, in terms of how you pay for it. So S3, you pay for what you use and it's very, very cheap. FSX, you provision by the gigabyte. So we have to predict what we're gonna use. And if we have empty space sitting on those machines, we're paying for that empty space. Uh, we are able to add it as we need and we can increase things like throughput so we can get data in and out faster. Uh, but it is much, much more expensive than uh, the S3 storage and we work very, we keep a very close eye on it to make sure that we're not over provisioning um, and we're adding it in small amounts as we need it. Um, so I've talked about the benefits of the, the directory service uh, at Nauseam, but I think that it's been one of those, uh, it came out of left field for us. We had to learn it very quickly um, and we had tremendous upside that we didn't expect. Um, so that's been great. Um, and so just to finish off my little section here, um, it's the virtual environment delivers what we expected it to, and it's a key part of the project now. Um, we can't deliver this in any other way with the way that our data expands and contracts with the way that our compute expands and contracts. Um, what's quite interesting though, is that the infrastructure cha challenges that we've experience with this project also apply to the digital atlas. Um, and so a lot of the learning that we've done uh, in this uh, defense GA uh, project, um, a lot of that is stuff that then gets applied in a much bigger scale to a digital atlas. Um, we're quite open with our communication to make sure that uh, anything that we've learned, anything that's of value is open and aware within the building and within our stakeholders. Um, but because of that, we're very conscious of scope creep. We don't want something that was built for five to 10 users working in a very particular way for a project to then become the de facto solution for bigger projects or the branch or an enterprise solution. Um, 
by all means the learning gets, gets applied, but we're very careful. Uh, but that's then where managing all of those internal relationships, be it with our enterprise GIS team, cloud enablement, cybersecurity, or other science teams within Geoscience Australia, um, managing that and making sure that people are aware of what our environment does do and doesn't do, um, that, that's vital and it'll lead to better outcomes for the agency going forward. Uh, when I <laughs> and so a little interesting anecdote line that I got told when I first started uh, doing some cloud engineering work was this idea of cattle versus pets. And that's that in traditionally your servers were in the basement, they were your pets, you love them, you nurse them back to health if anything went wrong with them. Um, you're very, very protective of them and you did everything to make sure they stayed safe. Um, the mindset shift to cloud is that the servers go from being pets to cattle. As soon as something goes wrong with it, you get rid of it and you get more. Um, and the faster that you can make that change is one of the big savings that you get um, from moving to cloud. Um, you, you don't become attached to the hardware in the way that you did traditionally. Um, but with this project, we've added this third category that was sort of dubbed endangered species. And uh, I, I think that really applies to our licensed servers uh, because they're precious and we keep them walled off from all of the wild animals that roam around outside them uh, because they're the key piece that makes it all work. And finally, this just this nice little line that I came up with um, is this concept of shadow IT where you are trying to work in parallel to what your IT department is, is doing at an enterprise level. And you try to find ways around things and things like that. Um, and that's not what we're doing here. So I like to say that we're sitting in the shade. We're not hiding in the shadows. Uh, we are by all means doing something that is different um, to standard, but we want to make sure that that learning is applied uh, to a potential enterprise solution for virtual environments, um, that other projects are aware of what we're doing and see if there's potential applications for, if not all of it, bits of it for what they're doing. I think that's about it for me. I think I'll hand over to Lauren now who'll talk a bit more about the updates to the topographic mapping program. Hey, thanks Dan for that and Kat as well. Um, hi everyone, I'm Lauren from uh, Lauren Carter from National Location Information as well. Um, I'm just going to talk about uh, what we've been doing with this map space. Okay, so um, all of you are probably familiar with these topographic maps that you see here uh, on the slide. Um, these maps were made uh, anywhere from 2006 to 2012. Um, they were made as an individual map. Um, each one uh, had to follow some strict specifications uh, that were um, put upon the people making them. Um, and um, there was also up to about five uh, contract businesses, on average about five contract businesses doing, um, doing these maps. And there was probably 10, if not more, um, staff in each of those, those contracted businesses doing the work. Um, so that's uh, a lot of time and a lot of people. <laughs> Um, and at the same time, we were also making a, making a data product, that being um, Geodata Series 2 and then also Geodata Series 3 of that as well. Um, back then, the technology was uh, a lot different. Uh, we were using ArcInfo for a lot of that and some uh, a lot of um, specially made scripting as well. In actual fact, it took about um, three to four months to make one map, um, and that's just the data product and the map itself. It doesn't include the time it took um to prepare the project file um and that was done by Oslik back in the day before um before Oslik became part of geoscience australia um and even after that three to four months there was validation and testing as well so i think from memory it's about over a thousand hours per map um so uh, the numbers are that to do that now with the number of staff we have um we i think it was 170 odd years it would take us to redo these maps in the same in the same format um, and they're also very difficult to update um, in fact i would say definitely impossible to update <laughs> all right so our solution our solution was to use map series with an arc pro um, thanks to uh, esri they have a, a map series option where um, we were able to make this solution that can be automated and definitely repeatable. So what we do is we have uh, one big map, a big national size map that drives the map series within Arc Pro, and we have a map index as well that, that drives that. And so at any one point, uh, we can click on a map that we want um, and it will put the map into our layout. 
Um, and so for that, we've also got these dynamic uh, elements over here that I'm showing on the side. Um, so the dynamic elements, they can be, uh, we've got map numbers, we've got the name and the number as well, uh, the little location diagram here within uh, Australia. Uh, the North Arrow is also dynamic, the locality diagram as well. A lot of these pieces you'll see um, are from the original maps as well, that sort of have the same look and feel. Um, and we've also got a QR code there that will link you directly to the ECAT record of the map where you can um, download it. You know, if you're using a map and a friend wants to know where you got it, they can use their use that QR code to get to it. So challenges. So as I said, we are a group of three to four cartographers. Um, we've had some help with other members from the branch with the data. So um, there's not many silos in NLI. We're pretty, we help each other out, which is really cool. In 2006, we actually had, we worked out about 93 people in NLI, and now we have about 30. Um, so we're doing a lot more uh, with a lot less. Yeah, and doing that on a very large scale as well. Um, so here we've challenged with uh, yep, staff numbers, and then what we decided to do was also reduce the paper size um, because a lot of the old maps, um, they had a lot of marginalia on the side. Um, and because we are not pre-printing these maps, um, we wanted to make them as small as possible. Um, so you're going to have to download your map and take it to a third party business for, um, for printing. So we've made the paper as small as possible for that. We have out of 516 maps, we have 483 that fit on an A1 and 33 that fit on an A0. Um, so the, the, the cost of printing is about $8. So depending on where you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're not selling paper maps, as I said. Um, so the data for the map, um, in the old days, we made the data as well, uh, and then obviously made that data to provide, and you could download that as well. Um, in this instance, we're using um, data suppliers that are already creating data out there in the world. Um, that includes ABS data for population and locations. We're using Geoscape, um, for roads, and also things like um, CAPAD, which is Protected Areas Database, and uh, which we got from, can, you can download from Environment, and also Envis and ACLUMP for vegetation. Um, and we are aggregating that data uh, as well. Oops, sorry. Aggregating that data so that it is suitable to display at um, 250th hour as well. Um, we are also using a lot of automation so, so that data can be replaced fairly easily. Uh, we're using a lot of data uh, queries for the display of the 250k data and also lots and lots of label queries uh, to make the, um, I guess, the map look pretty so that there aren't labels overlapping um, and uh, so that it's all displayed uh, really nicely with, you know, weights of labels and priorities and lots and lots of things. Um, okay, so to do this with our cost quality and speed triangle we have here, um, obviously to make this automated, repeatable um, and fast, uh, we have had to accept low, lower cartographic standards than we probably would have had in the past. Um, I think that we've done a pretty good job um, of this um, and uh, my little motto is that we are not letting perfect get in the way of good because we still have a really good map product here. Um, and, you know, it, it's a really, really big country and this is a really difficult thing to do and I, I really think we did a good job. So in conclusion, um, the benefits of this product are we are actually meeting the needs of the users. So the drivers for this was the public because they required, they wanted maps. Um, and also, as Dan, as Daniel said, for the onshore mapping for defence. Um, they were a really big driver for this project. Um, also, the data that is used on these maps you'll also find in Digital Atlas, um, the roads or the ABS data, um, reserve data, um, you know, lots. Not everything at this stage, but um, that's what we're working towards. Um, this was also an opportunity for a redesign, as I said, with... Um, you know, uh, just making it look more modern. We re revamped the legend, um, made them smaller. Um, yeah, and just, I think, giving the maps a more modern feel. Um, and they are extremely easy to update and improve on. 
um, very easy to change a layer, update a label, and then just rerun the PDFs, and, and they can be available for downloaders as quick as the data catalog team can get that um, into ECAT. So really good. So the outcomes, well, these are the first paper maps since 2012. Um, and to note that most of the maps, most of those 516 maps uh, actually were made in 2006. Uh, there was about half a dozen maps made in 2012. So they're all really, really old, around 17 years old. So um, it's almost the same age as my children. So there you go. Um, and in this, we're going to provide, we're going to get feedback from the public users. We get feedback from defence. Um, and that feedback can be implemented really, really, like, in minutes, really. <laughs> so it's fantastic. Um, and also our maps are now also available on our online dashboard, which has been revamped. Um, we are releasing them gradually just so that we can check them. Um, and we're doing that by zones. So we have uh, released zone 54 here, which is a um, 99 maps. Plus we, we added an extra one there. So um, there's 100 maps released. Uh, on the online dashboard, you can get the newest map, but you can also still download the older one if you want that as well. Um, yeah, so it's a great product. I think we're pretty proud of it. Um, yeah, so um, I'll pass back to you, Kat, for the recap. So you've heard from Lauren and Daniel how we've recently made some big leaps in how we do things. You've heard how we've been able to scale our compute power through the use of cloud technologies. Not only does this improve our efficiency through vastly reducing our data processing times, allowing us to do dramatically more in less time, but it also saves time in organising the extra compute power. It gets it down into the order of minutes rather than weeks or months. Secondly, you've heard how we've been able to move with the times of a decentralising workforce with cloud, meaning that there is zero loss of productivity or efficiency while working remotely or from home. I personally am an example of this as I'm a remote worker myself, one of the ones that Dan mentioned. And I can attest that because all the data processing happens in the cloud and where the data is stored, there is no penalty for having a subpar internet connection, meaning that processing does not take longer when you're working from home. Thirdly, you've heard how we've turned the production of maps from a year and decades long process to one that can happen in the order of weeks and months with Esri Arc Pro and with a lot less effort of staff and how we have the ability now to introduce updates quickly that apply to all maps at once in a matter of minutes. So we're doing more with less on a scale we didn't think was even possible 15 years ago when the last full or 17 years ago when the last full update was completed. And lastly, you've heard how we've been continuing on the path to making all our products as on-demand products as a service. But what's next? Although we've made significant strides in improving our product delivery chain or the data out part of the pipeline, exemplified by cap capabilities we're delivering like the Australian Exposure Information Platform or APE, you might have heard it, and the Digital Atlas of Australia, we recognise that our major challenge lies in streamlining the data in part of the supply chain. Currently, the data acquisition process is labour intensive and manual, taking a lot of effort to not only source the data from various sources, such as state and territory agencies, but then to also transform that data to suit the individual needs of each of our products it takes a while too. This can result in data inconsistencies across, across projects and products due to multiple acquisitions under different licences, or due to the time required to transform the data into formats or schemas needed for each product. So we're attempting to solve this problem through implementing the acquire once use many framework for our supply chain. We want to acquire the data once with an appropriately open license so that it can be used for all the different things we need it for. And then in our ideal world, that data would be automatically translated into the different schemas needed for different projects without any manual handling. This would mean that every product would contain the same data and be readily updatable. That is that our products would be the best available at any point in time, that they'd be current, accurate and consistent. We're currently working to develop reliable supply chains for data into our systems, and this itself is not a simple task. And this is where the Digital Atlas of Australia and its integrated geospatial infrastructure plays a role. <clears throat> but not just within our branch, throughout the whole of government. As a whole of government capability, the Digital Atlas brings together, curates and connects trusted geospatial data with appropriately open licences that can then be connected into a range of systems by any stakeholder. 
for our branches projects at the moment, in order to get the data into the schemas we need, we are building FME workbenches to translate the data. And our ideal state is to move those workbenches to FME server, now called FME flow, to enable updates to happen in a truly automated fashion. However, alongside more readily available updated data, there is also the vital need to have equally current, accurate and reliable metadata and the need for that to be available on demand when the data sets are created. So this is a space that we're thinking AI might be able to help in terms of automating the generation of the metadata. But at this stage, though, this is just an idea within our branch requiring a lot more investigation. Moving forward, we also want to continue to foster an environment of innovation in order to be well placed to solve future problems, not just through cloud infrastructure, automated automation of processes and AI, but also to be able to pick up the next tools that come along so that we can continue to support Australia's economic, environmental and social prosperity through better decision making. Be sure to check out some of the capabilities we've mentioned today and keep an eye out for some exciting things to come. Thank you for listening to our talks and I'll hand back over to Lisa to moderate the questions. Thanks, Lisa.